Hey there, friends. Heather Creekmore here. I'm glad you're listening to the Compare to You show today. Today, we are talking about something that's really difficult. Now, maybe you feel that way about every episode. <laughs> I don't know. I hope not. But today, we're talking about letting go of culture's beauty standards. And specifically, I want to talk about this from the perspective of letting go of it for ourselves but then maybe also letting go of it for our children as well. Ooh, yikes, that gets difficult when you have a teenage daughter who wants to dress the same way as the teenagers she sees on television or on YouTube. Yikesville, but we're going to go there today. We're going to talk about how do we let go of culture's beauty standards. And I'm going to share with you the story of a missionary It may feel like that's not going to connect at all, but trust me, it will. Her story will amaze you. So I hope that you are ready (laughs) to just dig in to this kind of weighty topic. How do we let go of culture's beauty standards and truly embrace the way God defines beauty instead of the way the culture around us does? And hey, if this show blesses you, if something stands out from today's show and it touches your heart in any way, there are two awesome things you could do for me. But first, leave a review that is one of the best ways that you can say thank you for this show. Leave a review on Apple or on Spotify, wherever you get your shows. The second way is you could tell a friend about it. Friends, we do not have to struggle alone. If you feel like you're struggling alone, let me encourage you. I know you're not because I know people around you are struggling in this exact same way. So share the show with them. Connect around this show. Talk about what we talk about here and build your own support group. <laughs> okay, it's it's super easy. It's free. Just say, hey, will you listen to this? Can we talk about it sometime? And you may just find a new friend to journey with to body image freedom. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Compared to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compared to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Hello, my friend. I'm glad you're listening to the Compared to Who show today. We're going to a tough place. And before we go there, I want to share with you a story. So I recently discovered through a client of mine, actually, the story of a British missionary named Gladys Allward. She was a British missionary to China in like 1930s, 1940s. And she was really someone that God used to help unbind the feet of the women in China who were still practicing this foot binding tradition. So let me tell you a little bit about foot binding. I think you've probably heard about it. I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't really fully realize all that it entailed. So foot binding started for Chinese women around 600 AD. So it was around (laughs) for thousands of years. And what would happen is that moms would bind the feet of their daughters when they were between the ages of five and eight. And it was part of the process of worshiping this Buddhist idol named Ganyan. Um, He was thought to protect women, but an older woman of the family or the mom normally or you, if you were wealthy, you would hire a professional foot binder. She would wrap the four smaller toes of the foot so tightly to the foot that they would bend underneath and try, kind of picture it going underneath the bottom of the foot. And when the foot is bound this way in this position, the foot would then develop this distinct arch. And of course, 
the feet wouldn't be able to grow anymore. Now, I think I knew that. I knew that they were trying to stop the feet from getting big is how I always interpreted it. But I didn't understand this arch part. And this arch part is what was really important. They were trying to reach a certain shape in their feet. And the shape was called the golden lotus. And the perfect golden lotus was about four inches long. And it had this specific curve to it. And that was considered beauty. In fact, more than just beauty, if you had that kind of foot that was considered erotic, elegant, attractive, all of those things that kind of go with this beauty standard that was held for Chinese women. And so what would happen, as you can probably guess, is girls that had their feet wrapped would get all kinds of infections. They'd get gangrene. They'd lose their toes. They would sometimes be crippled and not able to walk because I don't know about you, but I have all kinds of issues with shoes. So I get blisters all the time. And I've had many scenarios where after wearing shoes for too long, I wasn't able to walk. But I can't even think fathom having my toes being wrapped in this way and the pain that would have caused. So this is a problem for girls, but then they're growing up and their feet are deformed, right? Their feet are not doing what they were built to do structurally to support these women's bodies. So they had back issues and all kinds of serious um debilitating limitations because they were trying to get this perfect curve in their feet. And so Gladys was a missionary. She got there and she was actually hired by the Chinese government as a foot inspector. So around the time that Gladys got there, again, early 1930s, 1940s, um, Chinese government had determined that foot binding was a harmful practice for women. And so they had outlawed it. But there were places in China, especially in rural China, where that news hadn't traveled yet, where people were still trying to meet this beauty standard. And so Gladys was um, given the opportunity to be a foot inspector for the Chinese government. And now just think about this. She's a missionary. And she's now been hired by the Chinese government to go door to door through these towns and talk to people to literally free them from foot binding and really preach a message of you don't have to be bound anymore that was physical, right? But then also to free them from from the bondage of, of sin and shame, right? To preach the gospel to them, to share the good news, the truth of scripture with these people who had never heard the gospel message before. I mean, what an amazing opportunity opportunity this woman had. And I think about the verse from Isaiah 52, 7. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Gladys Allward, I don't know what her feet look like (laughs) physically, but I know she didn't have them bound, right? And so she had this beautiful opportunity to go minister to these women who were literally crippled by this belief that their feet had to look a certain way in order for them to be considered beautiful. And she's able to go in and say, no, stop binding your feet. Stop crippling your life. God already sees you as beautiful. Friend, are you getting any connections from that story? I just, as I read it and think about it, I'm like, wow, how many of our beauty um, rituals, shall we say, bind us? cripple us. I know personally from my own story with disordered eating and now kind of being on the other side of that, I think about how tired and obsessed and frustrated and unhappy I was most of the time because I wasn't eating enough and how my immune system was weak. And I I was an angry person a lot of times because I was so hungry, right? I I crippled myself for a standard of beauty, 
right? To meet that size that I thought was considered beautiful by our culture. I, I believe that that was an important thing to do, just like these moms believed in China when they bound their daughter's feet. But really, they were crippling their children, And so today, what I want us to think about is not only our own struggle with letting go of culture's beauty standards, with with recognizing that the word and the world define beauty differently, and seeing that we can cripple ourselves by defining beauty the way the world does. But I also want us to see how we can cripple our children if we're not careful, how we can put this burden on them, how we can bind them, maybe not literally, but maybe emotionally or spiritually to these standards of beauty that are not from the Lord. So let me take this story one step further for you. Right, because it, I, I understand it sounds a little ridiculous to us that anyone would do foot binding, right? Because it does, it seems like this is so odd. Like, why would you want your foot to look like that? That's not attractive. I mean, you can say all of those things. And yet, <laughs> this culture was completely convinced that that was what's attractive. And let me dig in a little deeper, even where this trend started for the Chinese was in the sex industry. This trend started amongst prostitutes. It started in the harem of one of their kings, emperor kind of leaders way back, like I said, 600 AD time period, where he believed that this was the most erotic shape of foot And from that, from it being just kind of part of the sex industry, it went mainstream. Now, again, are you tracking with me? (laughs) Do you think that there's any of our trends or standards of beauty today in our culture that maybe started likewise in the sex industry? Friends, I don't know about you, but some of the clothing trends I see, especially among young girls, I'm thinking, you know, not to sound like a prude, but my goodness gracious, if my grandmother saw these things, (laughs) she would think she was looking at something inappropriate, something that was from one of those magazines that was on the back shelf with a cover over its cover, right? And yet the creep is slow and subtle, right? The hemlines subtly and slowly get shorter and shorter. And again, I, I don't I don't want to make this a conversation on modesty. I believe modesty is more about the heart than the hemline. But at the same time, friends, what are we doing when we ourselves or we want our daughters to look more like the world, to match the world's standard of beauty. So I was recently talking to a friend who works for a crisis pregnancy center, and she was telling me how she and her group of friends had been watching homecoming pictures come by on Facebook and Instagram. And her concern was she felt like she was seeing girls posing in not a lot of clothing, in ways that at one point would have only been acceptable for the sex industry, right? Posing in such a way that it's seductive and provocative and sticking parts out and, you know, girls on top of each other, that kind of thing. And it's all kind of in the name of cute and fun and isn't this sexy and hot. But my friends... We can't do that to our daughters. If your girl will pose like that in front of mom, what's she doing when mom's not around? And there's no judgment in that at all. Rather a heart of concern. We need to make sure that we're not pushing our daughters more towards this definition of what it means to be hot or beautiful or sexy. Right? We need to show them and teach them something different. 
And I think for some of us moms who struggle with body image issues, it's difficult not to become the sports dad. Now, let me clarify what I mean by that, right? The sports dad is the guy who never actually made it to professional football, though he wanted to. And instead, he's going to live vicariously through his son, making sure his son is the best player he can be, right? Pushing his son hard to succeed at football because he never did. And I wonder to what extent, and I'm going to say this with so much grace and gentleness, I pray, but to what extent some of us moms, because we've kind of lost that ability to be hot or to feel like we're hot just because of aging and all the other things, we don't feel that way anymore. Are we trying to relive that through our daughters? Are we trying to show the world that, okay, maybe I'm not hot anymore, but look at my girl. Whoa, she's hot. She's someone you can envy. Friends, I I don't know if this is you or not, or if this is someone you know. I don't know if this is heading home at all, but this is just a general caution, my friend. Let's not do that. (laughs) Let's teach our girls that there's a godly way to be beautiful, right? That God has his own definitions of of beauty and sex and what is sexy, right? I think that's okay to say, right? Because God wants us to have beautiful, intimate relationships within the context of marriage. Song of Solomon, there's some pretty steamy stuff in there, right? God's not against these things, but he puts them into their proper places. And when we share sexy pictures of our daughters getting ready for the dance or, you know, uh, in other scenarios on social media, I think we are taking that out of its proper context. This is hard stuff, friend, but I'll have more for you right after the break. Hey there, friend. Did you know that I do coaching? If you've ever listened to the show and thought, hey, I'd just love to have a conversation with Heather. I think that would be really helpful. Maybe she could help me sort out why I'm stuck. Guess what? I do that. And I would love to do that for you. So no matter if your struggle seems eh, light, not that big of a deal, or if you've been struggling for a really long time and you're just overwhelmed, let's talk. You can grab a free 10 minute, just like learn about coaching session on my website. Or if you're ready, you feel like you know me well enough from the show, just dig in, schedule, grab a time and let's have a conversation. You can go to compared to who.me, find the coaching tab and you'll find all the ways to connect there. So how do we let go? of culture's beauty standards. You guys, this this is a question I could probably spend a whole month trying to answer because it's hard. It's hard to be in the world, but not of it, as scripture tells us, right? But we have to, I think, first acknowledge, as I'm trying to do in this episode, where this definition of beauty comes from. And I think to some degree, my friend, you probably are feeling a little bit of the heebie-jeebies like, oh, yikes. Could I be trying to promote a standard of beauty that came from an industry that I know distorts God's definition of beauty in the most horrific of ways? It's, it's tough. But, but friends, let me, let me kind of clarify something a little further. There's only two teams here, right? You're either for God or you're against him. And with beauty stuff, it gets so difficult, right? Because we want to be accepted. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be approved of. We want other people to see us and think we're beautiful. But I think what the church has done is we've conflated being seen as beautiful with matching culture standard of beauty. And I know I'm guilty of this. I once believed that I needed to look hot like culture said I should so that I could be a better testimony for Jesus. Oh, yikes. I said it out loud. Maybe you've believed it too. I don't think that was actually taught in any churches I grew up in, directly at least. 
But that's something I believed. I thought if I could look like the culture standard of beauty, then I would be more attractive for what I believed for gospel truth. But the truth is, friend, I could not succeed at chasing culture's definition of beauty and chasing Jesus. And like scripture tells us with we can't serve both God and money or mammon, I think the beauty idol, (laughs) beauty is a form of mammon. Beauty is a vain pursuit. Beauty is something just like money that we can chase and we can gather and we can try to collect and then it's going to all disappear one day, either through aging or when we die, right? Just to be glib, that's what's going to happen. But we can't chase them both. We can't serve two masters. I cannot chase hard after the beauty of this world and chase hard after the beauty of Jesus. Those are two separate paths. They do not run along side by side. They're two different directions. And so friends, if we're chasing the one, we're headed in a direction that I believe is away from chasing the other. And I think that's why it is so confusing and frustrating. And to go back to the word we used earlier in this episode, crippling and debilitating to chase beauty, because there's no satisfaction found there. There's no joy found there. There's no rest found there, right? Because it's never enough. You always have to do something else if you're chasing beauty. You will never meet the standard perfectly. And if you get close, guess what? The standard will probably change. Yikes. So going back to the foot binding, friend, are we finding our own feet? trying to chase the world's definition of beauty? Are we crippling ourselves and our daughters and maybe even our sons by what we bring into our home and display as this is beauty? This is what you want to look like. This is who you should emulate. This this is the kind of beauty you need to have. This is the kind of beauty we worship in this house. This is the kind of beauty we acknowledge. We see the people on TV and we say, wow, she's beautiful. I wish I had her legs. Oh, she's beautiful. I wish I had her body. Like, is that the beauty we're acknowledging? Acknowledging a lot, because if that's the beauty we're acknowledging a lot, then that's the kind of beauty we are worshiping and ultimately teaching our children to worship. Or can we believe God's definition of beauty? Can we believe that Gladys Allward in bringing the gospel to those people had really beautiful feet, (laughs) as Isaiah says? Can we believe that beauty looks like the fruit of the Spirit? That true beauty is love and peace and patience and kindness and long suffering. I think we all know someone who is physically beautiful, like empirically, they're just, they're a pretty person or a beautiful person according to culture standards. But maybe that same person, I don't know, isn't kind, isn't loving, is kind of arrogant, is kind of haughty. And inside we bristle, right? Because we see them as beautiful, but then we also are like, ooh, I don't want to be with that person. There's something repelling, repulsive about them. That is not beauty. And yet we probably also all know someone who maybe would never be on a magazine cover, maybe doesn't look that great in selfies, according to culture standard. But yet, because we know them and we know their heart and we know what a loving and kind person they are, we see so much beauty in them. We see this beauty and joy that radiates from them and we just want to be close to them. We just want to know them. Friend, that is the gospel's kind of beauty. That is Jesus's kind of beauty. That is the word's kind of beauty. That's what makes us truly attractive. That's what makes us the salt and light to other people is when we radiate that kind of beauty. Radiating God's love makes you hot, okay? Not maybe the way culture defines it, but it burns within you to where people will say, what what is shining so brightly in you? I want to know what that is. I want to be beautiful in the way you're beautiful. I want to radiate that kind of beauty. Friends, that is the beauty 
that we don't have to go on a diet or start a new exercise plan to radiate. We simply have to spend more time getting to know our Savior, spending time reading our Bible, spending time in prayer, spending our time connecting with Him. And guess what? It just flows out. It just shines out. That is true beauty. That is the word's definition of beauty. Friends, we got to let go of the world's definition of beauty. It's not making any of us more attractive. We're trying to emulate things that are not God. We were made in the image of God and we're trying to emulate idols and an industry that's not beautiful to the Lord. Today, I'm just going to encourage you, stop and think, can you let go of the world's definition of beauty? I mean, there's probably a lot attached to that. If you're like me, it attaches to size numbers and weight numbers and skin expectations and hair expectations and wardrobe standards and all of these things. It's all connected. All these rules that we establish for ourselves, usually from a young age of this is what beauty is. This is what beauty is. I have to be beautiful like this. I have to do this, this. And this, otherwise I won't be beautiful. Can we let go of that? And I'm not saying let yourself go completely. I'm not saying you never wear makeup again and you wear a paper bag. No, no. But if we want to truly be beautiful, can we believe that spending time with the Lord is ultimately what will make us the most beautiful? Can we believe it's more important to spend that 10 minutes, 15 minutes with God every morning than it is for me to get my hair and my outfit just right? It's tough stuff, y'all. But I hope I've given you some food for thought. (laughs) If you've got thoughts, if you've got comments, if you've got opinions, if you've got questions, hey, we've got a Facebook group and I'll put a link to it in the show notes here. Go there, show up there, tell me what you think or drop me an email, heather at compare2.me. I'd love to hear from you. But friends, I hope today I've encouraged you to let go of the way the world defines beauty and let's start defining it the way the word does. I also hope something in today's episode has helped you stop comparing and start living. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Before you go, if something from today's show blessed you, may I ask a huge favor? Leave a review on your favorite platform. Seeing your five-star reviews is a huge encouragement to me. Not sure how to do it? You can go to compare to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find all the information. And while you're at compare to who.me, check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image, comparison, all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can find out more about my books, or you can grab a time for a free 10 minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration. And I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free. Hey, have you found the Edify podcast app yet? It's a great place for lots of great Christian shows. Download the app wherever you get your apps.